Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to see some familiar faces and some faces we haven't seen before. We hope to see you again uh, in our series, Politics of Liberation. Today, it's um, our great pleasure uh, to have with us Professor Susan Robertson. I am personally very moved because I know Susan from my days uh, at Bristol University. Um, thank you very much, Susan, for joining us. Susan will talk to us today about something that is extremely relevant to what's going on in Greece as well. So issues around higher education, the neoliberalization of higher education, and how how to go on with this. So we'll, Susan's talk uh, is uh, titled Just Educational Futures. And as I can see, and the politics of liberation. So Susan, the floor is yours. So thank you so much, um, Rosa and Georgia, to uh, offer this invitation. It's um, just a wonderful occasion, a wonderful event, um, and a wonderful series. And I do want to take quite seriously the theme, uh, the politics of uh, liberation. And uh, the way my talk will uh, develop um, is I want to do some diagnostic work on quite a big, uh, important debate that's going on amongst political scientists particularly, um, but also um, our economist friend, uh, Thomas Piketty, um, on essentially um, education is the salvation really for liberatory politics. Okay, that's in a nutshell what the argument is. And I'm going to query that, um, and I'm going to put forward a case, um, and it's a case, though it's a specific case, and it's the case of England. Um, um, what I want to show with that case is that, in fact, unless we do this much more situated um, and closer kind of analysis of the kind of dynamics at work, what we do is that we miss something of the um, not inconsequential granularity that actually makes uh, a certain kind of politics um, possible. I want to do it um, kind of thinking with um, the wonderful Lo Rosa Luxemburg um, with us. Um, it's um, the Institute here is hosting this event, um, but we've got a great deal to learn um, from the kind of writing that she was doing um, about a hundred years ago. And more or less, the kinds of politics that we're swimming in at the moment um, are not that different from the kinds of politics that were swirling around when Luxembourg is actually having to um, not just engage, uh, she engaged in teaching herself, um, in her writing, um, but particularly in her organising, um, her collaborations and dialogues with uh, Lenin, um, her difficulties at times uh, with her own kind of the, the party politics actually. So it, uh, and, and then I want to actually come to, um, and so where would the politics of liberation actually come from um, if what I'm actually saying about uh, education actually um, is the case. Um, I'm not going to claim that in fact all education systems, um, and I'll focus specifically on higher education. Um, I've got uh, some of my own doctoral students working on the emergence of a, of a left in Chile, um, the difficulties nevertheless in Chile to land uh, a redrafting of the constitution, but nevertheless, um, that's been a project in the making in Chile uh, since the uh, students began organising around about 2006, the Penguin Movement. Um, so I want to start essentially um, by um, kind of recognising um, that for the moment anyway, education seems to, education itself, seems to uh, kind of be bought centre stage and it's being asked to do a, a lot of work around reimagining what a future might uh, begin to look like. Um, and that ranges from multilateral agencies like the OECD, and, and, and we'll see this, I'll raise some questions, in relation to UNESCO's um, International Commission on the Futures of Education. They put their report out at the end of uh, 2021. Um, I also want to actually uh, place firmly on the table that the big um, corporations and the big tech corporations have absolutely got education in its sight. 
uh, venture capitalists are investing uh, seriously in large amounts of money. And they run arguments around um, you know, the industrial model of education. Um, and in fact, actually, you can look at um, uh, now, Alphabet uh, was Google um, Classrooms. You know, it'd be huge amounts of um, investment that's gone in, particularly through the COVID period. And we know why that's the case, because essentially the ed tech firms uh, essentially see that's where the money is to be made. Um, but we also have organised labour, and I w would want to say that, uh, in fact, I've been um, privileged, actually, to work with Education International. Um, big global union that uh, represents teachers, um, whether they're academic teachers or uh, school teachers, um, or even actually um, non-state uh, organised <coughs> teachers, and been campaigning with them over a number of years around um, uh, the, the, the kind of the excessive privatising that's, that's gone on. Um, at the same time, I also do want to say that social movements um, that some of them are actually naming the cognitive empire, and I'll come back to this, uh, this, this idea. Um, and the argument kind of, they, they range over um, the idea that we should have personalised learning, or we, should, we could you know, perhaps have social movement learning um, through forms of organising to generate greater degrees of democracy, um, and so on. Um, and it even goes to some of the big um, uh, Ten cent to uh, Charles Yadan has made a, 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 an amazing amount of money from TikTok. Um, he also invests significantly, like the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, in trying to kind of shape uh, futures of education. So this is a recent report uh, that came from um, UNESCO. Um, some of the best intellectuals uh, were brought together that include uh, um, Morozov, who's writing most recently on in the New Left Review around techno-feudalism, uh, included in that group too are people like uh, Arjun Apadurai. So these are intellectuals, many on the left, but not exclusively, politicians and so on. But... And, and, and the call was to reimagine. So typically UNESCO will uh, undertake these kinds of um, very significant reviews. Uh, the reports come out there typically every decade. Uh, we had the Delors report. Um, the 70s was the four report and so on. And it strikes me that these are potentially opportunities to um, undertake what I'm going to say, some serious diagnosis of the situation that we find ourselves in uh, today, and particularly a diagnosis around um, commercialisation, privatisation, marketisation. We could use lots of different words to begin to describe the um, erosion, fundamentally, of uh, the knowledge-producing institutions um, that, uh, for sure, social reproduction, but it doesn't get entirely reduced um, to those things. But if you take a search of that document, what you'll see is the word capitalism never appears, ever. And I kind of did a... Um, you'll have odd kind of gestures uh, in the direction of... Um, of, of marketising um, or what are nicely called non-state actors. But come on, these are big corporations with huge investments, um, not just directly going into education via platforms, but actually um, the, the Gates Foundation, but they're not the only ones, they're the obvious ones, um, but um, incredibly busy. All the big corporates have foundations and many of them are actually very busy um, um, shaping education policy. It's not actually what comes out the other end, you know, scholarships and things like that, which was the old form of uh, philanthropy. This is venture philanthropy, okay? Shaping up um, education systems in the kind of mirror image of the kind of, um, kind of social relations that represent the kind of social relations that they've brought into uh, the conditions for capitalism uh, fundamentally. So I want to now turn to, uh, so this is UNESCO, um, but it's, in, in all cases, what connects a, a number of these different um, kind of uh, interlocutors that we're going to look at, and UNESCO, is a concern with uh, rising social inequalities, uh, 
big issues around climate change, um, uh, major concerns around the breakdown of social bonds and you know, even the conditions for the reproduction of, of capitalism itself. It needs forms of social cohesion. Um, otherwise, what you have is kind of anarchy in, in societies and so on. And here's Piketty uh, himself actually um, reflecting on, um, as the others have too, uh, rising social inequalities and uh, that in fact actually that the, the rise and the rise and the rise, and particularly from 2008, but it goes on, starts beginning, even the OECD is naming uh, growing social inequalities and the implications of growing social inequalities for societies prior to 2007, 2008. And what we know from all of the work that came out, Piketty, um, we could strike all of those that are actually writing, um, Brankovic and others. Um, the, what we see is a, a, a kind of a takeoff um, after the 2008 crisis of, you know, the upward um, movement of wealth, you know, being concentrated in a, a tiny and an even tinier kind of um, uh, group elite. Um, and in fact, actually, it's interesting, I was looking at some figures, uh, not so much looking at that, but if you look if you took the wealth of the big five ed tech firms and put that wealth together, that wealth is about the same wealth as uh, the GDP of, of, um, of Germany, of uh, the United Kingdom and of France. I mean, so you see, not just in the big corporates, um, but you see concentrations of wealth um, amongst a, a very tiny kind of group. And Piketty does a, an interesting kind of analysis of that in capitalism, that, or capital, it's not capitalism, that was the problem in the 21st century. Um, the book that I actually want to engage with here is uh, his uh, more recent work. Um, so he's thinking about the ongoing problems of inequality and uh, has become quite interested and quite taken with um, cleavage theory. Um, and cleavage theory fundamentally is um, drawing on work that had taken place, reflecting on where you actually see um, um, the, the organized, occupational um, organization and, and occupations and different income groups and how that kind of maps on uh, particularly into uh, voting, so political preferences and so on. And uh, what they're... What they're looking at at the current time is, in fact, actually what you might be able to also say about the rise of populism um, to some extent, left populism, but mostly it's actually about right populism. So in capital and ideology, and he, he works with very big teams here, um, these, it's kind of a, like a big, big data kind of um, world of political science here, reflecting on growth growing social inequalities, kind of looks lovingly in many senses at the, um, the, the 30 glorious years as Hobsbawm kind of characterised it. Um, and, but, but actually falls uh, here and says essentially um, every human society must justify its inequalities. Um, every epoch therefore develops a range of contradictory discourses and ideologies for the purposes of legitimising the inequalities that already exist or that people um, believe should exist. From these discourses emerge a certain economic, uh, social and political rules which people then use to make sense of the ambient social structure. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but essentially the kind of criticism um, is the same criticism that was launched um, of him um, and his big team um, on to do with capitalism in the 20 or capital in the 21st century, and that is that uh, he engage with, engages with capital, but less so with capitalism uh, per se. Um, and like in the previous capital in the 21st century, um, there was a kind of lazy, I would say, um, innocently lazy, not willfully lazy. Um, you know, the education, the, the future was in education. You invest in education. And at the time, I wrote a, a, an article for uh, the British Journal of, um, as a special issue on uh, um, education sociology, kind of critiquing um, that, that kind of, 
almost innocent kind of glancing over at education as if nothing had happened in the world of education, that somehow it sat on a shelf beyond neoliberalism. There was no processes of commodification actually taking place. Um, and it, in fact, actually, it was kind of a race between technology and education in capital in the 21st uh, century. Um, in this particular case, what uh, Piketty and others um, are, are potentially kind of interested in is, you know, and I think it's uh, kind of well motivated to some extent, is um, can we kind of see uh, shifts that are starting to take place um, in, in part because of changes in the kind of occupational structures? In other words, um, the you know, large industry, industrial, uh, industrialization looks rather different uh, than the rise of service-based economies, the kinds of occupations uh, that we actually uh, see there. Um, just a couple of things around the kind of big data set that he uh, uses uh, to, to, to draw on. Um, in this particular case, Piketty and colleagues are actually um, looking at posts Soviet uh, countries, Latin American, and uh, Western, uh, so-called Western uh, democracies uh, to develop um, their analysis. And essentially the question is this. Is the rise in levels of higher education across different societies a consequence of the transition to a knowledge society, in turn transforming values, political alliances, and voting behaviour? Because what we can see essentially is some interesting kinds of shifts where uh, some of the working class would appear to be uh, shifting across and voting, let's say for Trump, um, the old working class, and what you can also see, and if we took Cor Jeremy Corbyn and uh, UK-based uh, politics, um, they were able to enrol um, incredibly well-educated um, you know, middle-class kids into uh, the Labour Party. And in fact, actually, it was probably the largest, um, the biggest uh, left uh, party uh, right across Europe. And you can see this as a potentially kind of seductive uh, thing here, that in fact, actually, where would liberatory politics actually begin to come from? It might well come from the better educated, uh, and so therefore, you might assume that more education is actually going to create um, the possibilities for a politics of liberation, which is what makes it interesting for this particular uh, theme, uh, for the, this, this year's theme for, that um, uh, we're, we're speaking to. And do these left-right shifts in voting patterns represent, and this is where they're going, it's the realignment or cleavage theory, a new realignment um, or a, an, along new lines of cleavage. Um, so in this particular case, uh, these lines of cleavage are actually to do with education and income. Um, and if so, what are the implications of this? So I want to just reflect on um, and, uh, and several kind of, um, kind of research groups that have actually got into this kind of debate. And you, you see a fairly uh, binarised and actually... Uh, to some extent, I would probably say um, uh, somewhat nasty um, <laughs> education cleavage. But this got a lot of um, press, actually, when it came out in 2017, Bovis and Weil, uh, or Willie. It's, um, uh, I, think they're, uh, I think they're from Belgium uh, research group. Um, and they represent it this way. Tell us what your highest diploma is and we'll, we'll tell you who you are and what you do. Um, you'll be a university graduate, you watch, okay, so now these are cultural attributes, um, the kind of things that you actually read, uh, what you do with your school children, um, what schools can, do they go to, where do you go on holidays, what are your cultural pursuits, um, and so on. Um, by way of contrast, uh, we have... Um, now, and these are supposedly, and you can see mapped onto this here, are the so-called ignorant, nationalist, nativist, working class, populist, right populist voter. Okay, Brexit, for example, would be a good example here, or the, the, the vote that's going off in the direction of Trump. So this is a quite binarised, it's quite um, um, identifying kind of these kind of 
cultural attributes. Um, and here in this particular case, we'll basically say that your career ended after junior high school, so you've not gone on to university. Um, this is your cultural pursuits. This is where your children go to school. Um, this is where you take holidays, and so on. Now, in the background here is in the cleavage theory arguments is the idea of that the transition, and I'm using these words quite deliberately because these are the words used by um, these researchers, the, the transition away from um, a period of industrialization, okay, a la Daniel Bell's arguments, into a knowledge-based society Okay, society, deliberately I'm choosing here, um, and it's the kind of language that they're actually using, um, results in okay, a more knowledgeable, cosmopolitan, tolerant, this is our um, well-educated, and a uh, intolerant, rather ignorant, uh, nativist, um, anti-race, uh, anti um, and certainly anti-asylum-seeking um, populations, um, and so on. So now what we've got is the idea that the rise of the knowledge economy, which uh, education, but specifically higher education, um, delivers, or is, is kind of tasked with delivering, um, and I'll say something about uh, that a little bit further on, um, has, has actually delivered um, a cosmopolitan elite that's now voting to the left um, and a rather ignorant nationalist, nativist, um, rightist, uh, populist um, kind of working class. So left has gone, left has gone um, <laughs> right, and right has gone left. Um, and uh, more recently, I actually gave the annual lecture for um, Thesis 11 um, around... Uh, left, right, out. So we can go um, left, right, but we can also look at them as populations that have been left, right, out. But that's not the kind of argument that's being uh, developed here. This is quite binarised. It's um, teleological. It's, it, it is a kind of an, it's a, a, an assumption that simply we've just moved somehow. Um, perhaps the magic hand of the market or the hidden hand of the market has just moved these societies kind of on to this other state. Now, let me remind you when Daniel Bell was um, writing this venture in social forecasting, um, when he you know, puts out this idea of the rise of the uh, kind of knowledge society, it was a venture in social forecasting. And what Bell's doing at the time is casting around uh, at the end of the 50s, going into the 60s, for where might the accumulation strategy come from, okay? because if the production of goods has actually been de-industrialised out to, down into bits of Mexico, but particularly out into the Asian world, then the developed economies have got a major problem on their hands, and that is, you know, what's the basis of accumulation? Now, this is where Rosa Luxemburg's uh, work is incredibly important, um, her um, fabulous and only kind of extended work, which is the, um, the accumulation of capital. And the bits that for me are particularly interesting um, kind of come in at about, around about page 360, kind of 365 thereabouts. Um, and there's a number of insights that uh, she, she's actually developing. But capitalism has always been incredibly good around looking for new markets, um, using the globe to actually do that. Um, the country that I actually come from, Australia, um, essentially we get um, the kind of the dispossession of the indigenous populations as you get an expansion outward and it wasn't simply just about um, placing, um, you know, any of the Irish and the Scottish that you didn't get on with into the colony. This was also about um, a politics of extraction um, that begins to take place. Now, Piketty doesn't do quite the same thing, but he's, he's kind of, he accepts the cleavage um, theory argument, you know, the transition to a knowledge economy. Um, but he becomes quite interested in essentially uh, in capital and ideology, um, drawing on electoral surveys, 50 elective democracies here, 
um, going right back historically. Much of the data is a little bit dodgy, but think, so they're having to develop um, proxies. Um, but comes up with his quite seductive what's called the, um, the Brahmin left and the merchant right. And we can see these kinds of things happening. So we can, we can look at um, high and low uh, education, and we can look at high and low income. And we can begin to place um, people with high and low, you know, and combinations of, of this across into these different kinds of quadrants. I mean, Joran Thurborn's done a lovely piece in the New Left Review, if you want to chase that down, um, developing a really significant critique of, um, to some extent, um, a lost opportunity. Um, suggests that, in fact, actually, um, th there's, there's not the kind of attention to the kind of granularity that you would kind of um, expect, and certainly not any uh, great attention to um, some of the kinds of specific specificities in place um, that would become important to enable us to say something about, you know, even what would constitute the left. So if you look at the left in the UK, the left is not recognisable as much of the left. It's quite centrist, if not to the right. Uh, and that's, you know, Blair takes it in that direction. Um, it's the reason why Corbyn uh, really can't get any traction politically. Um, can, you know, words like socialism basically kind of chase uh, people like Corbyn and, and others um, trying to kind of push for s at least a, some kind of redistribution um, of some kind. So, the, the first question is, you know, what does it even mean to think about the left and the right in this particular um, uh, case? Um, isn't looking at political manifestos at all, um, simply just takes, and in fact actually just takes, so the educated, um, the high education, um, or the educated in this case, as opposed to low education, high education, is the top 10%, and the other 90% are the um, less well-educated, under-educated under of sorts. It's not the kind of um, statistic that Bovins and Wilds are, are actually using, but in this particular case, more or less fundamentally, you just walk, thinking about masters and PhD students, um, the uh, census data, and we'll look at it a little bit later, has come out in England literally about a week two weeks ago. And uh, those with um, at least an undergraduate degree, if not more, is 33.8%. Thir that's really high. It's not your top 10%. I mean, that's a, that's a large number. And actually, if you look uh, at London, it's in the vicinity, the concentration of that credential, being highly educated uh, in London, um, is in, in the vicinity of about 60%. Um, and not all of them are working for the services industries at all. You'd probably have very large numbers of um, perhaps asylum seekers, refugees, uh, people who, with um, high levels of education but uh, quite low levels of income, actually, uh, in that regard. And actually the ethnic um, element, which uh, Piketty doesn't pick up on at all, um, in fact, actually does quite a bit of the explaining of some of this kind of left uh, politics. So what we have, um, and there's a bit of a critique that's kind of launched here, because really the so-called Brahmin left, um, and it doesn't hold for all the countries at all by any stretch of the imagination, in many countries um, included in this 50 that in fact actually don't look anything like this, so like there's no shifts. Um, and in fact actually the cleavages would be more likely to be described as gender-based or religious, for example, in Iran. Um, but nevertheless, these are very big claims. Now, it matters that it's Piketty, because Piketty is very busy, um, you know, working alongside uh, left-wing political parties, trying to organise um, their kind of uh, left-wing uh, manifestos. Um, and what Piketty's answer to the issue of uh, how would we actually um, get some kind of shift in the direction of liberatory politics or a politics of liberation is simply to say, let's have more higher education. Now, you can read that at the surface level, um, where it looks as if you've, if you've got a high level of education, um, but the question is, what, what's the nature of the politics that might underpin 
that that might be going into. Um, but the other kind of issue here is that there's simply an assumption um, that one caused the other, that your access to higher education caused a kind of left-leaning politics, as if there's something particularly kind of substantive about the knowledge production taking place in that place. And so my argument really here is that um, surely you'd have to be looking to some extent at knowledge production practices in the institutions and you would somehow have to develop an account of um, how is it that in fact higher education, that certainly in the case of England, has been almost so thoroughly marketised um, that in fact that's the kind of outcome we get. I mean, um, Correlations are not causes, and so it's the fallacy of a correlation um, being asked to do some causal kind of um, analysis here. Um, there's another group, um, they've been uh, doing this work, uh, US-based scholars, Kit Shelton, Rame, um, they're somewhat more complicated uh, in their analysis. Um, they uh, make some similar kinds of claims. This is the transition to a knowledge society. Um, and, uh, but, but essentially what they start to do is they, 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 they look at um, whether in fact on, in terms of education, you're progressive or regressive, uh, and in terms of income, whether your um, politics actually goes off in the direction of um, more kind of, uh, more liberal or less, more authoritarian. Um, orientation to, to politics. Um, and so they come up with slightly different kinds of uh, results to uh, Piketty. Um, and in fact, nevertheless, state, uh, so I'd say probably the uh, problems in this kind of analysis is the kind of the easy assumption that uh, the transition to knowledge societies has created this left-right uh, kind of shift. But they do find some ambivalences kind of in the middle. Um, there's a kind of a middle group that they can identify um, where essentially, um, and it's this middling group, um, um, where uh, they can go either way, um, essentially. And um, they are also kind of arguing um, um, too in this. Um, and so departing company to some extent with Piketty, um, that in fact, um, that, that that in fact what you've got is these kind of cross or diagonal kind of pressures kind of in there. Um, and it would be those groups essentially that you would actually as a political party have to capture, um, that kind of middle that could go right or it could go left. Um, and, uh, but what they also find, uh, unlike Piketty, is that in fact they've also, you've, you've also got a, a, a well-educated uh, that uh, has got also high income, so well-educated high income that also go to some extent to the left, but they could also go to the right. So they're a particularly interesting kind of group. Now, the kind of, um, what's sitting behind some of uh, this, and then I'll kind of get into the case, and I'll get a little bit of kind of paste behind this, is um, the, the kind of work by Daniel Oosh, uh, who's actually um, looking at, and, and rightly kind of saying this, that in fact actually the occupational structures uh, look very different to um, those that we saw through the industrialization period. The old working class is not the same uh, working class as the new working class. Um, they're <coughs> largely in the services sector, um, they're dominated by uh, now uh, growth in female. Um, but they also argue that, in fact, actually, and, and this is the bit that I want to highlight uh, to you, that what would explain the left vote for them is those who are the new working class, <coughs> the new kind of middle working class, um, or to some extent, uh, in if, if put professors in here, um, these would be the well-paid, um, you know, okay, all of you here, if you're professors, you're well paid and um, <coughs> you're, uh, you're also voting to, to the left, okay? So you're high income and uh, to the left um, and well educated. Um, and I'm not sure I, there's, that, in fact, that actually stacks up. I mean, there's been huge amounts of um, erosion of um, proletarianising of, of work. There might be a, a few stars that kind of make it through. Um, but what 
<coughs> Ush, and this is what's interesting. So what would explain for Ush um, the, uh, the shift to the, to, to the left? And <coughs> Ush argues that, in fact, it's the, uh, it, it's the, what he calls the interpersonal work logic. So if you engage in people-to-people -people work, and the assumption here for Ush is that you work for the state. Okay? The expansion of the state welfare, you work for the state, and um, so you've got an interest in uh, kind of protecting your state-based jobs, um, but you're also engaged in kind of person-to-person -person work. So this is care, education, health, and so on. Um, and that would, for Ush, kind of account. And many of these writers, all writing in and around this area, actually draw on Ush's, Ush's work, as does Ush's in, in more recent publications, a 2016 one. Now, several things, I think, are really important to observe here. Many of the public sectors have actually been outsourced if they've not been privatised. Um, and much of the so-called public sector, even if the state is underwriting the public sectors, um, have actually uh, embraced full-on uh, neoliberalism uh, with its fetishising of individualism, competition um, and innovation, as Richard Sennett would uh, describe it. And so the, 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 the it raises doubts in my head, short of actually um, doing some <coughs> empirical work, um, as to what those, re what, the, what the kind of causal <coughs> mechanism uh, might well be. Nevertheless, that's the kind of question um, that is actually being uh, pursued. So, this is where it boils down to. Um, if the level, so I'm repeating um, the issue also raised earlier by <coughs> Piketty, um, is if higher education is a key variable in voting left, then essentially now we'd see the basis for some kind of um, political um, agenda. Now the work that <coughs> I've been doing with a colleague, and I just want to um, acknowledge some of the uh, opportunities to work with some um, uh, fantastic colleagues, particularly in, in Cambridge. Um, and what we've been interested in doing uh, in this work um, has been um, kind of looking, looking at some kind of paradoxical kinds of um, um, developments. So this is uh, Jonathan Measures, and he's reflecting on the same problem that Piketty is reflecting on, and that is that um, uh, we see a rise in social inequalities, but what we don't see is a parallel rise in concern for significant social inequalities. And what Measures does in a, looking at um, big survey data and so on is to actually uh, look at, and we can see the case of the United Kingdom here, the United States, is that in fact, um, and this is the way it goes, the more unequal you are, the more on the world value surveys and so on, the, the data sets that they're kind of looking at, um, is, to, um, is, is, is to actually say that um, it's, your, you, you, it's your individual merit. Okay? By contrast, the more equal societies in the survey data, um, they've got quite big kind of value data and so on, is... Um, the more equal societies would, would actually uh, attribute to uh, structural reasons. If you don't get ahead, it's because you don't have access to social, cultural, economic capital and so on. But the more unequal societies, um, you attribute it to yourself. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by this. What neoliberalism is going to up to is uh, you get ahead, uh, you get ahead on your own, it's your investment in yourself, and this comes by way of Friedman, um, Becker uh, and others. Um, and and, and, and so the, the question then would be, you can't presume then, so if we complicate the story a little bit, more education in a, a society that has embraced neoliberalism and is now uh, much more unequal is much more likely, actually, to um, not have you shift necessarily to the left, but in fact actually just kind of you know, almost um, embrace a politics of kind of individualism. Um, and we might have left votes, but 
it may not be a vote in the direction of solidarity. It may well be a direction um, in and and for the uh, and redistribution. It may well be a vote in the direction of simply trying to secure um, your opportunity to get ahead in the in 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 the race uh, fundamentally. Um, this is really interesting work. So what I'm going to do is just quickly summarise, and then I'm going to show you. I'm going to develop a slightly different argument here. Um, so we've got Piketty. Um, and we've kind of uh, Piketty and Bovins and Willy um, and the problems of that. We've got Usha's kind of work. Uh, we can see with uh, Mises, uh, we can see actually that meritocracy is being mobilised to justify inequalities. Those kinds of accounts, despite Piketty um, being on the left, in my view, offer us a bourgeois kind of understanding of the dy dynamics that are taking place. And what I want to do is I want to... Um, go off in the direction of uh, some of the insights. Rosa Luxemburg, probably the foremost um, thinker at the moment, um, it would also, in, in this kind of um, territory, would be uh, Nancy Fraser's work, um, Cannibal Capitalism, um, The Old is Dying and the New Can't Be Born. But she's been on this kind of uh, track of analysis for quite some time. Um, and actually, at some point, I know in uh, Germany, actually gave one of the Rosa Luxemburg uh, lectures uh, drawing on Rosa Luxemburg's um, accounts. And so this is, so I want to take a case um, and I'll develop the case kind of quite quickly here. Um, but essentially um, in this case, it's important that we actually look at um, economies, um, not in the abstract um, sense of could it, would it be uh, feasible, um, often as Marx was doing, uh, but actually to try and look at kind of the real economy, what we actually see kind of um, actually going on here. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank some of my doctoral students who've been working with me on, on some of these um, kind of analyses of shifting dis discourses, uh, Michele Martini uh, particularly, but I've got other uh, of my doctoral students who are actually working on um, politics, left politics in places like Chile and, and so on. Um, and what I, what I want to actually do here is to actually um, be very clear that, in fact, um, uh, all of this is work to make, to, to go from into a form of prim primitive accumulation and then to more or less kind of deliver um, a, 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 a much more kind of full-blown market as we see in higher education in the case of the UK has required uh, a huge amount of political work uh, driven forward by the state. Uh, that state and those political elites are backed by economic elites, um, and there've been some. There's been some wonderful work, um, theory, culture, and society, um, um, and uh, reporting on some of those kind of elisions between the economic and the political elite. And you can see how that kind of would happen. Um, but Quinn Slobodian would also make the incredibly important point, and uh, he's one of the foremost kind of analysts at the moment, doing some beautiful work around uh, rereading and reading again neoliberalism. Uh, because what's at stake and what's at issue here is to have the state do the work to help create the market, institute the market, but fundamentally to put um, pol economy beyond politics. And you do that through trade agreements. Um, and it's some of the work that I've actually um, been doing. Um, and I've done that for the, the unions. So this economy, uh, a so-called knowledge, soci knowledge society, there were two possibilities running through the 90s. Um, it comes down in the direction of a knowledge economy. Uh, we, we, we don't talk about a knowledge society anymore. So I find it really interesting uh, that Piketty and others uh, do that. Um, and there are kind of epistemic losses uh, when you actually don't acknowledge uh, quite what is at work. The OECD, the World Bank, um, kind of get in there in the uh, 1990s, and the knowledge-based economy sits on four pillars. One is um, the fetishising of the digital. The second is uh, the investment, particularly in higher education, human capital. Um, the third is 
uh, around innovations, uh, but institutions that might both drive but also capture innovation, intellectual property. And the fourth element of that is to have a, a kind of a pro-market um, economy. Um, and uh, the, the bank, uh, Knowledge for Development, that project um, 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 went looking around at all of the different economies around the world and who was transitioning um, and the bank's job was to kind of be the handmaiden and the OECD into this kind of transition into a particular uh, knowledge economy. Now, knowledge is not innocent. And one of the points that Rosa Luxemburg uh, makes um, too is that what we have is, you know, the kind of forms of imperialism that in would include um, cognitive, the cognitive empire as Santos would describe it. Um, so if uh, these investments in uh, higher education um, and uh, the privileging of certain kinds of uh, curriculum are uh, here, I think of economics that basically gets us into trouble, ACA, the 2008 crisis, um, and so on it goes. So there's a refashioning, um, so the effort to make markets, trade and education services, uh, movement, let's say, of students across borders, uh, capacity building was talked about, um, um, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, all of those countries, in fact, uh, had not invested significantly. Um, in um, the making of their own institutions. And this would be where you could actually make now new markets. Um, what was important about this kind of moment was, in fact, actually the parallel institution, the World Trade Organization, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, because that locks in the economy and the interests of the economy from politics. Okay? Any nation that wanted to renationalize would have to pay um, significant amounts of money back to the investors that got involved in investing in education services. And I've written quite extensively on that, and there are, many ca there are cases we can see. Um, and it happens across a number of different industries. Uh, North American Trade Agreement operates in the same way, many cases there. Um, the uh, WTO basically uh, gets into trouble, there are lots of protests, um, a lot of stalling and so on. Um, and it's not to say that, that those negotiations go away. 2006 and the uh, services directive in uh, Europe essentially locks in, and even for the UK at the time, um, the uh, right for um, any of those getting involved in investing in education to have their investments uh, in, honoured in... So what would be the, your losses into the future if these were to be kind of taken back into uh, the uh, renationalised fundamentally. Um, so there's a huge amount of work, I want to argue, uh, that operates at multi scales. Um, it's, uh, you, you don't run politics at a, the scale where you're going to get a lot of protest and, and, and resistance. You run politics at either a global, where it's not organised, or even at a regional, and I mean at the European scale, when people are not organised either in terms of labour unions at, at, at that kind of level. Um, and it is that the services directive that in fact was quite instrumental to enable some of the development of uh, the economy, um, the creation of globally competitive um, and market um, uh, in the case of the UK. I want to um, acknowledge now here the work of Michele Martini, who's a wonderful semiotician and has been working with me. And what we've been looking at is all of the big um, HE reports. And what we're interested in is whether, in fact, we can see discursively the kind of work, let's say, that the HE reports, higher education reports, are engaged in. Um, the first one, the Deering Review, uh, which is, um, I'd say, is the moment of primitive accumulation, softening up, um, you know, potentially fees, raising issues about it not being um, affordable. Um, certainly international students are moving in and out and um, on different fee structures to what they actually have uh, now. Um, but it's that kind of conversation that's being raised in the Deering report um, that ultimately sets up the conditions for the creditors, um, loan companies and so on to ultimately uh, get involved. Um, and they become quite important, the financialization of the sector um, and that faction of capital that's become incre incredibly important. Um, you'll see the second report here, um, and these are actually, um, these are not just... Um, Dots chosen, these, are, these represent um, kind of value or volume. Um, 
So the second one raised to the top was the Sainsbury Review. It's essentially um, making the strong case for universities to now drive the knowledge-based economy. Innovation, patenting, um, entrepreneurs, um, all of those individuals that now become the new, um, embrace the social relations and the new mode of accumulation um, for uh, the expansion of capitalism, both internally and kind of externally, because of course any of these um, innovations um, that, that might be being developed in universities will be um, taken to market um, and, and scaled up. Um, but I'm, I'm going to come to make some interesting kind of observations. The Brown Review, just quickly, is to um, um, essentially erase academics out. The focus is on students as fee payers, now they're the consumers, um, to enable uh, for-profit providers to enter into the sector. They couldn't, they couldn't access the student loan uh, company at all, um, and they couldn't either as a, uh, a, a venture capitalist, um, but they can now. Um, and success as a knowledge economy, essentially. Um, look for the word university in the last one. Disappeared. So now what we've got is a, a, a changed entity. The university has disappeared. The, the, the identity of the university is now only one of um, a number of kinds of providers. Um, and so what we've got is the Oxbridge, uh, kind of, so it's, a, it's a, the Oxbridge is the elite, elite bit. Uh, the Russell Group is the next level down. Uh, we've got the so-called million plus, and we've got the so-called alternate uh, providers. This shouldn't surprise us if we're following Gary Becker's work because essentially what you don't want to do is invest huge amounts of money or have investments going in the direction of uh, expensive investments of those who are not going to be your elite. So basically you've got your mass, which is sort of access to higher education, human capital. So this is so-called egalitarian. Um, um, but it's public power that's kind of, in Nancy Fraser's kind of language, um, moving this forward and moving it forward in such a way um, that's the Competition and Markets Authority. There's, uh, it's the minister that appoints the Office for Students and UKRI, so they're two ministerial appointments. Um, and essentially, if the party politics kind of get it right, um, it's, 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 they direct and direct the market through those kinds of um, institutions. So that's happened essentially on the back. So what we've got now is fee-paying students, 9,250 a year. That's just their fee, um, which they get lent from the government. Okay? Um, and the government is underwriting, it's not the government, it's the public, are underwriting this, um, any of the debts that are not paid back. But what you can, what you can see is that the, if, of the revenues coming into the university, so these slides, this, this is the, it's the student revenue line, which is the most significant. So now what you can see is that the, um, you see a socialising of the costs of research. Okay? So research is not being paid for by the capitalist, who's very dependent on this, um, that's being socialised and as soon as innovations emerge, that gets spun out, outsourced, um, kind of quite quickly. Um, deep mind, any of those kinds of examples uh, would be good, uh, good examples here. Um, and in the Cambridge ecosystem, we see many of these, you know, GlaxoSmithKline, big entity, um, Microsoft are visible, um, um, and so on it goes in this in this kind of ecosphere because essentially um, it's but it's student fees it is student money that is underwriting the the research cost because having been a, a, a kind of a senior uh, leader in my own university there as the head of the faculty um, it is social science students that significantly and their fees that underpin the um, costs of research. Uh, we don't make any money on research, and in fact, actually, significantly in the sciences, we lose money. I think it's only engineering that makes a bit of money. Um, the rest is actually being underwritten. Um, and, and, and you can see it's actually the beneficiary. It's the uh, pre-1992 universities. So now what we've got, and this in, um, in Rosa Luxemburg's kind of language is important. She, she argues, and she argued with Marx on this, 
um, and is, is that you, you have to have an inside and an outside. Now, her, her outside was beyond the nation state, forms of imperialism and so on. But there's a good case to argue, and Nancy Fraser also argues this too, is that you, have an, you always have an inside-outside. So we've got um, the production of inequalities, okay? the inside-outside, those who've got um, more secure jobs, those who don't, um, those students who go to more elite institutions and those who don't, and then we've got kind of differentiation. So these inside-outsides are incredibly important. It's used as a mechanism of disciplining, forms of exploitation, um, but also potentially new kinds of products. Because if you want to be able to find your way um, not to one of the outsides, but to one of the insides, you're often investing significant amounts of more money. And actually, the um, tutoring uh, business, it's a billion dollar business to move you somehow. Yeah? And, and we don't see much movement um, at all. What's driving this is a, an effective economy. Um, this is my version using um, of, of, you know, um, though they're winners and losers. Um, um, and what comes with this economy, and I want to make something of this uh, shortly, is that it affects the body. This is just not cognitive. This is actually the, 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 the sense of a feeling of, um, as Will Davies describes it, uh, nervous states. And he will argue in that book, which is a lovely read, um, this, is, this is not a, an alternate. This is the uh, kind of logic um, or the happiness industry. Um, these, are, these are just, they're not rival orders of worth. They're complementary orders of worth. That this affect of economy genera generates a degree of um, vertigo. Um, I've playfully used um, Quinn Slobodian's uh, depiction of the 1930s and um, the so-called barometer vision when the economists and the statisticians are having to kind of graph the world economy. Um, and, but, but this vertical vision, we're invited constantly into a world that's organised vertically, okay? horizontally too, this kind of differentiation. But the winning and losing uh, is about how to get to the top. Um, and the psychic energy um, that is expended constantly uh, in terms of actually staying there. It operates in multiple ways at the level of nation, at the level of institution, at the level of individual, um, and it is incredibly uh, pernicious, but it is incredibly effective. Um, look at who doesn't get involved in global rankings. Uh, look at what country doesn't embrace it uh, in some way. So. This has been a very successful uh, project in, in many senses. Um, what, we've, what we can see actually is a um, huge increase in gross enrolment. So essentially um, the monies that are actually coming in uh, student fee-based um, and uh, which are actually uh, powering these uh, universities um, and underwriting, uh, socialising the cost of research for capitalist uh, development, pretty much, because that's um, there's not much money in the social sciences or humanities. Um, the groups that do particularly well out of this are the uh, high tariff. Uh, well, the, the high, uh, all of them pay a high tariff. So, to some extent, you know, y the reputational value of your degree um, from, let's say, the million plus universities is not the same as the reputational uh, value that you actually get out of um, the Oxbridge institutions. And in fact, what you can see is there's the production of a particular elite who become uh, significant uh, beneficiaries um, in there. Uh, the international student um, monies is also uh, flowing through, um, and they flow through to particular kinds of um, universities. Um, but even amongst the international students, there'll be um, differences. There'll be insides and outsides where your family can afford to send you. Um, it depends on the kind of wealth of the family. Um, it's generated uh, really significant returns for economies like uh, the UK. Um, this is in the billions. Um, for Australia, it's the third, if not fourth largest income earner over an, of goods and services. So this is a real economy. You know? um, the generation of uh, services, education services, um, and, and to try and lock it into uh, 
trade agreements where what you can't have would be the threat, the Corbyn threat, uh, for example, to uh, more or less nationalise. Um, th there'll be an interesting, well, they're out of Europe now, um, so that might be, have been one of the beneficiaries. But they would have been caught up, sorry, in the, um, the, uh, ge the, ge the general directive um, uh, that was the EU one. Um, so that's just to kind of make that simple uh, uh, point. Um, but that comes with a, a huge amount of indebtedness. Um, the figure at the moment uh, in terms of students and student loans is 200 billion. Um, Canada periodically has a uh, moratorium. Basically, they because <laughs> um, you leave the country, um, they've tried to chase students and their debt um, to different countries. Um, for the moment, it's underwritten by the state, um, and uh, Gabor writes about this as. Um, uh, the kind of de-risking, because none of these companies, so if you're investing, let's say if you're Arden University and you're a for-profit university, venture capital backed, um, students actually uh, take out the loan if they don't pay the loan back, um, Arden doesn't give a toss um, at all, okay? Uh, this is what's called de-risking. It's the, it's, it's the public and so now the public are being hit twice, aren't they? The so-called public that are paying um, to underwrite the socialisation of research and the public are also paying uh, in perpetuity in terms of the, um, the debts that are actually not being paid back. Um, what's happening at the moment is the government is dropping the floor. Um, that you had to earn above a certain amount and then you'd start paying back a certain amount of money. However, nevertheless, finance capital here, um, the state was borrowing at a very low level of interest, you know, it was barely over half of a 1% or even less, um, but nevertheless was actually charging students something in the order of about 6%. It was pretty high. I mean, it was astonishingly high. Um, and in fact, you would have been better off um, not taking out money from the state, but actually trying to uh, take out, if you could, um, take out money yourself um, on the money market. Either way, you're borrowing money, nevertheless. Um, there's something very interesting, nevertheless, if we look at this uh, later census data, um, because actually, if you remember, we're looking at quite a high level of um, those who are enrolled in education, and it would seem to me that if you're looking at something like 33.8% of those, so level four is um, having uh, some kind of undergraduate degree or um, a level four qualification. So it's beyond secondary school, um, but doesn't include um, the kind of TAFE kinds of qualifications. Um, but there's a fair degree of attrition kind of here. So le people who've got levels of indebtedness um, didn't finish their degrees for various reasons. And in some cases, we know they're part-time students, all kinds of um, kind of reasons for that. Um, um, but the inside-outside also plays itself in uh, here because what we can see actually is um, first uh, young full-time first degree entrants from low participation neighbourhoods uh, typically are not ending up. Um, this is no surprise here, um, but they're not ending up in the kinds of institutions that would actually enable them to generate the high income. So maybe they are the well-educated but uh, low income. Um, but what, what we also know, particularly around some of the work that Danny Dawling has done, is that some of that group are deeply aggrieved that the promise of the graduate premium, um, if they invested in themselves, uh, in fact, wasn't returned, that they are in MAC jobs. They do have a degree that they've paid out for. And that has not been returned in terms of the so-called uh, graduate premium. The inside-outside plays itself out also in academic life. Um, this is the uh, UCU, which is the union, um, has been chasing what are called um, performance around zero hours contracts. Um, and uh, Rosa, I'm sure you recognise this from your time, uh, certainly when the fees ca came in. Uh, what you want to do is you want to spend as little as you possibly can on um, the labour that's actually going in, um, the, uh, the, the labour that's actually going in in order to um, 
produce an educated uh, or a person with a credential. Um, so what we've seen fundamentally is um, an increase in uh, teaching only contracts. These are typically uh, year to year to year. They're not a full year. Um, um, and typically, so you're not getting holiday pay here. Um, they're very different kinds of contracts to people who are doing um, teaching and research. So there's been an escalation, 70% versus um, those who've got teaching and research contracts, uh, which are the highly desirable. So essentially what's happening here in Rosa Luxemburg's kind of case is we can see forms of stratification taking place inside uh, the academy, um, and it's the, the disciplining that's kind of going on. Um, you kind of stick at it, and uh, I'm not saying anything new to anyone in this room, um, in order for you to become part of the core and not part of the, um, the per periphery. Um, but that precarity, uh, Wolfgang Strake in a, quite a recent paper, uh, no, it's not that recent, but 2020 writing with Dukes, um, uh, basically um, suggests that the, the zero hours contracts and these much more precarious contracts look very much like the Amazon kind of worker. And there'd be some interesting work to kind of do there, looking at the, uh, the, the ways in which objectively the interests of the Amazon workers, who have been actually organising, they're on strike at the just about to go on strike at the moment if they've not been on strike in the UK. Um, and, and Amazon workers have actually been um, interesting about how they've managed to organise. Just a couple of little things and get to a conclusion. Um, the, this is not the only thing that's then going on, is the, the development of the market. Once, and think of uh, what I said about intellectual property here, and what's driving the so-called knowledge-based economy, um, competitive knowledge-based economy strategy, is the enclosure of knowledge as intellectual property. And think of where Google came from. All of these proprietorial um, venture capital backed initiatives um, and so on. And in this particular case, um, it's not just in the UK. Um, the, it, it enters into uh, kind of global, as Luxembourg would say, we can't think of a national economy um, as if it's not part of a global world. Um, and in this particular case, we've got shifting geopolitics, um, the rise of China, um, Australia, the Netherlands, the United States, the UK. All of them have identified uh, the risks associated with um, doing research. Um, so you can't collaborate. All of your collaborations with China have got to be managed. Uh, huge amounts of training that goes on. Um, the, uh, the person who in charge of the institution, or in my case, I was my role as head of faculty was head of institution, is I have to make sure all the people in my faculty have actually got the kind of training that might recognise that, in fact, some Chinese student in your class, maybe it's a, it's a biotech kind of laboratory um, somewhere in Cambridge or whatever, is in there possibly representing, um, you know, the Chinese government. Um, and there's kind of really pretty nasty stuff, highly racist. Um, the United States, uh, they're not allowed into working in certain kinds of areas, um, in certain kinds of laboratories um, in the United States. Um, and this is, this is just the check sheet. Um, but you can see it comes out of the cyber, the Centre for Cyber um, Security here. Um, so, it's, so, so now what we have is uh, knowledge, not as commons, but as enclosed, uh, meets geopolitics in the global economy. And uh, these knowledges uh, are not open, um, and they're open to forms of espionage, uh, fundamentally. As if that's not enough, essentially... Um, also tied up with geopolitics is uh, the war on terror, um, the uh, prevent duty that comes in, um, that uh, in fact actually uh, every uh, academic is um, being tasked with, um, has to be trained in the identification of a potential kind of uh, person who might become a terrorist. Um, all of our speakers on a campus have to be vetted for the risk that they might be speaking on something. But what this has started to intersect with now is any kind of public criticism, potentially, of the government. Um, there's what's called the... Um, this is some campaigning that's going on, uh, no platform for fascism, but the government is trying to, and it's not there yet, but it's called the Free, free Speech Bill. 
So any of you that might be uh, publicly speaking, that might be re engaged in, let's say, a critique even of government policy, could be regarded as inciting, um, so this is, you know, um, um, in, in inciting the crowd. And uh, what's also going on at the current time, um, right at the moment, is what's called online, the online safety. So now we've got the intersections of multiple kind of dynamics, you know, forms of imperialism to do with market making, um, but also the way in which markets themselves as forms of um, knowledge enclosure um, actually set themselves up against other kinds of um, kind of projects. Um, Ibleb has kind of talked about this, uh, about what's going on for the level, at the level of individuals and, um, and, and describes this, um, she's, I think it's one of Will Davies, I might misrepresent her, but um, students um, recently done a PhD at uh, Goldsmiths. And again, doing this kind of um, Hayek and kind of close reading of Hayek's texts. And it does bear close scrutiny. Um, when we scrutinize Hayek's text, he's quite eugenicist, um, it's about the fittest survive. The argument is that the market doesn't care. The market does care. Markets are made by um, these social socially made institutions. Um, and so this idea um, of the, the market not kind of, but, but essentially it's to kind of weed out the unproductive uh, fundamentally. So this is where I've been going in my own work um, with, um, again, several colleagues, but particularly I want to credit uh, Michele Martini, who's postdoc with me for the last three years. Um, and what, we've, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, look at um, the way and over time what, what happens is we see a moving away from... Um, you know, let's say an, an early uh, phase of um, a primitive accumulation, sort of that early <coughs> deering, you know, market-like um, new public management. Um, and then we see some forms of ownership, outsourcing, that kind of thing. But most recently, and we put this broadly under the Washington consensus if we wanted to, you know, use some kind of more political kind of terms. Uh, but most recently, um, we argue that you can see actually uh, uh, that the rise and the rise of uh, finance capital, the big tech firms are moving in, um, their, um, their creative models are actually rather different here. Um, it's um, asset creation and rentier uh, relations. Um, and again, um, the, the, the thing that's really important here is to recognise how inventive capitalism actually is. Okay? Um, it's not the capitalism of Marx, um, the, uh, the, the capitalism of Marx, not just the, you know, those who sold their labour um, and those who um, um, own the means of production. Um, there's something more complicated actually going on here. And here I've been um, taken particularly by um, Etienne Balibar's recent interventions in political economy, um, who's actually looking particularly at the way in which um, sectors like education um, are being kind of caught up in this. Um, and it's, um, he's describing it as absolute capitalism, where processes of commodification and the creation of fictitious commodities, because human beings aren't commodities in that kind of sense, um, but nevertheless they are, um, have a kind of the object of processes of commodification. Um, and to quote, Absolute capitalism is a steady process of commodification or creation of new fictitious commodities w without which the process of accumulation cannot be maintained. But it leads into the incorporation of reproduction processes at the biological level, at the intellectual level, so our knowledge, um, at the symbolic level, um, but the biological, it's kind of our, our bodies. Um, and, and kind of valorizing all of these, um, both forming value, but also um, kind of, it's new additional kinds of uh, value um, that are actually being um, kind of created. And this process of commodification, says Balibar, is operating both at the level of production through uh, forms of, of, of production and exploitation, but also at the level of 
uh, consumption. So we're consuming education and a certain kind of education which takes the starts to discipline us in, in very particular kinds of ways. And it would be what I'm describing as the privatising through. Um, that in fact actually in a Gramscian kind of sense is the interiorisation um, and of, 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 the, of, of that kind of accumulation uh, strategy. So this is all pretty um, not surprising in many senses, but it's, it's a long distance from the kind of um, um, Piketty kind of analysis, uh, in my view. And it's this kind of analysis, I think, in education uh, that we need to engage with. Because there are things like, I mean, can you believe it? I could, I could sell... If a venture capitalist wants to buy a little bit of my future in return for the earnings that I might get, there are mechanisms to do that right now, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Okay. Now, the venture capitalist is not going to, let's say, lend to you unless it checks out what kind of family, what kind of cultural, economic um, forms of capital sit behind you, the kind of industry that they expect you to go into. Uh, but right now, right at the moment, there's a very live and well industry. Uh, many of these venture capitalists have come out of Airbnb and Google um, and are uh, engaging in this, these kinds of new, new products. Initially came out of Chile, um, but in fact actually they've pushed um, social impact bonds, human capital contracts, and so on. So again, it's the, when, when you begin to interiorise, you act like the owner of yourself as a, as a form of commodity. Um, in, and, and with property relations. And not in the sense that John Locke was kind of describing to do with actually having the right to begin to contract. Uh, this is something much more pernicious. So what's to be done? And I don't want to... Um, these are students outside Cambridge um, are having a lovely conversation earlier around um, how it's been noted internationally how politicised the Cambridge students have become. Uh, many of them, my students actually, uh, driving some of these as organisers um, and their, their doctoral students, um, organisers, um, campaigners um, and so on. Um, so I would also want to suggest that we can um, you know, look to the left um, in, in many senses. Um, this devastating and withering critique that's just come out uh, from Nancy Fraser um, cannibal capitalism, because fundamentally um, her argument is two things. One is you can't get commodification all the way down. Um, you can't. Essentially, when you've got the inside, outside, capitalism always wants to not pay for some things. So it needs social reproduction and it needs to kind of keep this inside, kind of outside uh, kind of happening. So we do see it's, it's, it's not a kind of flat ontological kind of uh, process here. Um, and we get winners and we get losers, don't we? And so what, what one would actually want would be to uh, galvanise, to mobilise at least some of the losers and to actually see that those who are losing, uh, it's not the migrant population who are the, that you want to turn on as the losers. Um, as the losers, objectively, those who are the white working class losers are objectively in the same position as anyone with e ethnic backgrounds and so on it goes. So stitching together that kind of coalition um, is going to be really important. Um, one can't um, underestimate the work that that's going to take because the way it's bifurcating at the moment, if you run with the first kind of analysis, is you've got a kind of cosmopolitan, more globally oriented elite who wouldn't see that they've got anything in common with let's say, a more nationalising, you know, wanting to go after your jobs, um, somewhat nativist and, and so on. And something going forward has got to be able to kind of uh, give. Um, we, we see, I, it seems to me, um, some real insights from Luxembourg's work, um, the importance of the spontaneous, she would argue, the importance of institution building, she also says, um, the importance of, this, of certain kinds of institutions that would underpin um, social democracy that might move to somewhere else. And she was a believer in the institutions um, of social democracy that might be able to move us in the direction of um, that kind of um, more thoroughgoing kind of critique of uh, capitalism. 
Um, Strait kind of thinks that essentially it'll all just implode, um, but we'll all go down with it. Um, but, I mean, that's it's easy to say that, isn't it? I mean, if we look at the inventiveness of capitalism, um, it's, it's and finance capital, which essentially it's, Rigi will say it's got its twilight, you see finance capital in the twilight years, um, but it's been astonishingly uh, kind of inventive here. Um, there's a big debate raging at the moment between um, some of the best minds, really, around, you know, do we see the rise of techno-feudalism, which I think would be a great new theme for an, another series of the Luxembourg, um, because, in fact, um, it has forced um, some of the key writers that include Fraser, um, uh, Morozov, uh, all of them kind of in there, uh, Durand, um, to try and think again um, about uh, how do we understand capitalism and how is it different from feudalism um, and so on. So let's just conclude. My own position on this is that higher education needs to be analysed in the context of 21st century capitalism and its accumulation strategies, of which it is a part, uh, both in terms of the production of the kind of so social reproduction, but also increasingly um, the production of fict fictitious commodities and so on. Um, we saw that it was got embraced as part of the knowledge uh, economy, I'm going to say not society, strategies, um, where huge amounts of work has actually gone in over the last 30 years, the multilateral institutions, the corporates, the McKinsey's of this world, um, and so on. Um, what's important... Um, I think, in what I've tried to argue, is that um, uh, Luxembourg's insights about uh, both the world uh, economy and society and also the, the inside-outside kinds of dynamics um, that are fundamental um, to understanding what we're actually uh, looking at here. Um, because for, for Marx, essentially, there would be a moment of exhaustion, uh, whereas um, that capacity to be incredibly inventive, um, you know, well, you've got Bezos going off to Mars, hasn't he? Um, new commodities like education um, produce the means for the productive sector, reproduction, as well as producing the subjects themselves, where individuals are not just exploited, but also are transformed. And I'll just give you the example that one of my PhD students is kind of working with. Um, as Chile went to the left, the school children became the university, uh, protesters became the politicians. And it's difficult, they're finding it difficult um, to have a parent say, to, 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 if you want to put state-funded education on the table, they say, we want the right to pay for education. It is so internalised, so interiorised, um, that in fact, actually, um, this idea that it's a commodity, you know, that you're paying for, and organised through um, many for-profit firms that operate in the education world in Chile. Um, and so the question of how, if we're looking at Chile, which was the laboratory um, in the 80s, uh, you know, as the laboratory at the current time for how do we actually unmake the market. Um, it's not straightforward, but nevertheless, I do want to say, making the market wasn't straightforward um, either. And it's not properly landed. It's not put beyond politics, I'd say, still at the moment. The state is in there. Um, when it's put beyond politics um, in a very secure way, um, that's when state or public power essentially um, enables this to just become part of the normal kind of uh, common sense. Are there limits to co commodification? Um, a number of writers kind of uh, think and say that there is, in which case there's always uh, social life that isn't commodified, um, but nevertheless is uh, typically available to be put to work for the processes of commodification, because in fact certain kind of markets also fail. Um, but for, for uh, my, my sense is for Luxembourg, um, and this is where I would probably part company a little bit with uh, Eric... Oh, no, not so much Eric Ollenwright. Eric Ollenwright, a uh, wonderful scholar, died uh, several years back, um, did try to do the, the work of real utopias. You know, could we imagine concretely and what would that begin to look like? Um, my, I have a PhD student currently, and uh, Alex Trinidad, who's currently working on um, 
uh, the uh, University for the uh, Landless Peasant Movement and popular universities and so on. So we have examples um, in places like Brazil of, uh, and even the World Social Forum would put itself up as a kind of more uh, popular uh, social movement site for education um, and so on. So um, amassing some of these examples of alternatives also become um, quite significant, it would seem to me. Um, and so I just want to um, leave it there to say thank you and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Susan. That was super interesting. Now, have we got any questions? The floor is yours. <laughs> have we got any questions from you? George and I always have questions, but <laughs> we try <laughs> to hold back. And if you could say a little bit more about the forms of stratification when you were talking about the enclosure of education, was it? Yes, yeah, so the forms of vertical and horizontal stratification become important um, in the sense of this becomes in Luxembourg's kind of terms, the other. You could be part of the precariat, okay? Uh, that's also the destination, okay? So it works... Um, so she's, so, and I'd probably say Nancy Fraser's using this inside-outside um, dynamic um, in a really sophisticated way now, and it doesn't just apply to, uh, in Luxembourg's case, it would have been, um, you know, non-capitalist uh, societies, you know, it'd be a bit hard to find where some of them might actually be now. Uh, but if we take um, what Luxembourg's trying to tell us, and that is that there's always spheres of social life that could be potentially incorporated that might have included also, we think of uh, the UK, you know, old areas that have been de-industrialised, there's no investment going in, and then there's a kind of new kind of making over. Um, okay, so this, this dynamic of, um, of, of inside operates in relation to those who are excluded, who are also exploited. Fundamental to keep this here, Okay, so they're part of it. They're engaged in the social reproduction of this over here. But they're also part of, and she would think of, uh, you know, domestic work, house, you know, uh, people who, who uh, in fact, actually labour but don't get paid, for example. It's fundamentally important, but engage in all the work to do with social reproduction and so on. But I think we can work quite dynamically with this inside, outside, and it'd be work... Um, all the different ways in which these inside-outsides kind of... Because if it was a flat structure, there's no dynamic in here. There's no competition, okay? Capitalism works with competition, yeah? And this competition um, and the, the fear, the anxiety, the anxiety to do with precarity and the possibilities, what I'm calling vertical vision, um, yeah? That's, that's a really important kind of dynamic of... of, 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 of keeping us engaged in this. But it's disciplining. Right. Very disciplining, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exploitative disciplining, um, yeah. Is there a question from someone else? So, thank you a lot, it was a great talk. Um, I have um, some thoughts. Um, first of all, I thought very interesting the way you have conceptualized, you know, the way that you know the interconnection between the market and the university and the in general the knowledge. Uh, but I found, I mean, your last idea about um, a specific. Uh, Concrete ut utopias of Eric Olin Wright. So um, I'm, I want to make it specific. So I'm wondering uh, why, for example, I mean the um, the kind of the Labour Party of Corbyn in the past few years before you know to be dissolved. Um, 
to which extent did not uh, mean include uh, in its programmatic um, and pre-electron campaign and its claims, you know, the, the marketization of the university. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, uh, shouldn't be a claim, I mean, on behalf of the left, that this type of privatization of everything should stop, I mean, uh, and I mean with uh, specific ways, I mean, to say that uh, cancel the student debt or, I mean, um, and to, you know, because, I mean, this type of condition was not always like this, it was 2011 and, you know, this type of reform, so universities in the United Kingdom was not always, you know, in the way they have been nowadays. So this is one thing that uh, I find interesting and also, uh, what um, uh, you argued about, you know, who are the people, in reality it is, in the theory of revolution, I mean, uh, the people who revolt, I mean, are those with, I mean, who are, have already lost something and they want it back, not the people who are, you know, in, uh, let's say, in, they don't have anything. So in, because you said something about uh, who goes to the right, who goes to the left, I mean, that, uh, and also I want to say that, of course, I mean, does not mean that if you have, you know, an education that this necessarily will lead somewhere to, you know, uh, or it is enough uh, to become uh, a leftist or whatever. It is m much more complicated than this. And uh, I found your talk very, you know, useful in this type of deconstructing uh, of Piketty's argument. So, uh, if I just think of the, your first question and mm. the, um, the the Corbyn's agenda, mm. it was huge. There were huge rifts in, in the Labour Party. Mm. Yeah. Um, and in fact, actually, um, Corbyn um, was as surprised as anyone that they actually managed to get um, sufficient vote. Um, and that was young people organising, actually, um, the uh, kind of so-called Corbynistas, um, you know, very much like in the Bernie Sanders kind of case. Mm -hmm. um, but there were many in the Labour Party um, who, um, you know, did, you know, the kind of Blairite group, more or less, mm -hmm. who saw that this was actually political suicide mm -hmm. as well. So we, we, we had the potential, you know, if you looked at the kind of agenda that uh, Corbyn kind of put mm -hmm. out, um, it would be to actually um, have uh, education, higher education, as a as a public good. Mm. Okay, um, and actually, if if you if you think of it at the moment, um, you know, if the state is significantly underwriting, I think they've dropped the floor so that it's about forty percent now. Um, it's about sixty percent that's potentially going to be paid back, um, and forty percent that that won't be. Um, the the public is kind of playing twice. You know, here yeah. you, you almost want to say, you know, you could even just do some qu quite straight kind of talking here. Um, you know, you you pay for your degree, and then you you maybe you don't pay it back, but nevertheless, at some point, a future generation is going to be paying back a yeah. significant amount of uh, money, kind of going into the future. Um, but there's a wing of the Labour Party, um, and that that in fact actually has an eye on um, winning the so-called next election um, and, and it's, it's a continuous kind of thread through from the Blair kind of years. Mm. Brown doesn't deviate and many of those policies that I kind of showed you um, essentially, um, all of them are pretty much, um, it was the Brown review was commissioned mm. under Labour, um, uh, it was several policies, you know, it was the globally competitive policies of uh, Mendelssohn, for example, that drive um, all of those. So Labor's deeply, deeply, deeply kind of complicit kind of in that uh, there. But the second, the second question that you actually ask, I mean, it, it's, it's not always the case that it's those who've lost something. And I, I was quite kind of um, pleasantly really surprised as we were organising some of the first um, kind of uh, teach-ins and that kind of stuff. You know, really top draw professors of um, uh, mathematics were out there with loudspeakers, you know, and they had secure jobs at Cambridge, so you're not going to be booted out as a young professor um, out of a math department. Um, 
in Cambridge. Um, and, and they were on the picket line and organising and, and, and so on. So, I mean, it, it would be how do you win the hearts and minds um, of also those who, you know, in, in this case, uh, they have secure jobs, okay? They might be being docked pay. Um, but I was just saying much earlier that, in fact, actually, um, there would be, even in the institution, there'd be a, a memorandum that would come to us, and I was a head of faculty. Um, name all the people that were out on the picket line or not turning up to teach their classes, and send them through, and we'll be talking, docking. Well, a bunch of us who are <laughs> middle-level managers um, said, no, we were not going to do that. This, this is absolutely not what we're going to do. If you want to do it, you do it yourself, but not us. Don't. Um, and... Um, and a number of us actually got together to figure out how we would support and in sol solidarity, stand as middle-level man, head of a faculty, on the picket line, um, in solidarity, but also at times I knew I had to go. So I would just have conversations um, mm. with um, colleagues um, on the picket line, the organisers, about this is when I could be there, this is when I won't be mm. able to be there, that, that kind of... Um, and it, and it, and it made for a different kind of politics, it made for a different kind of engagement. Um, because the threat's actually about how much money is coming out of your pay packet, and for, uh, you know, if you're on a zero hours contract, you know, I mean, there's no money. That day you work, if you ma manage to get that work, that's the money that you've actually got uh, kind of coming in. And so, but you know, let me just say, I mean, we're, it strikes up and down the country at the moment. Um, the nurses, the physiotherapists, uh, the Amazon workers, um, the doctors, uh, the train uh, drivers. I mean, it's going off in the direction of what Luxembourg would absolutely have loved, which is a, almost getting, you know, a bit of a general strike kind of taking place. And in, in part, it's kind of driven for the Amazon workers. They've figured out how much money Amazon made. Um, each Amazon worker could be paid, is the calculation at the moment, uh, £91,000 and there would still be billions and billions left for um, Bezos, essentially, in his account. And I guess in the organising of our kind of left campaigns, um, it's that kind of... I mean, it would be the kind of fact-finding and campaigning that Rosa herself did, you know? Constantly on it, constantly reading, constantly looking at what's going on in different bits of the world. She was an extraordinary woman. Um, her ability to write, describe, know what was going on, travel, you know, uh, what was going on in different bits of the world. Um, and um, my, my sense is, and this is where she was very determined that she was right, um, that you've got to get beyond kind of um, the nationalisms of the nation and actually get a broad coalition going forward. Um, and, and I've tried to engage with Education International um, as a, a mechanism for potentially kind of doing that, commissioning pieces of research, figuring out what we might think would be the killer facts. You know, when the Panama Papers came out, for example, if we looked at how much money was stashed in the uh, tax havens, that was the sort of money that if you wanted to get every kid into school, that's where you'd find it. Now you just need political will, yes. democratic social institutions, <laughs> to actually engage in some of that kind of It's very interesting. Oh, can you hear me? As what? No. No. Oh, no, it's yours. It was yours. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Your talk made me think a lot, Susan. We have a very different condition here in Greece, and I was very interested. I mean, I had the experience of the UK before coming here, and I, I mean, I've been. I was in position to observe how neoliberal got deeper and deeper in higher education after the Brown report. Uh, on the other hand, you know, because I, I, we live here and we think about, I was very interested by what you say about stitching coalitions, how do we create that, with whom, and that precarity is not something that is, that is exclusive to ethnic minorities anymore, but it spreads the precarity of contracts. Here in Greece, we have a very different situation in the universities, a very different condition that creates uh, exclusions of other sorts. So for instance, we have a public education, publicly funded, so you pay zero money to attend university, uh, in very different conditions. Uh, 
As I told you earlier, I was teaching at Pantheon University and I found myself with 900 scripts to mock for 500 euros a month. So a very, a very precarious position anyway. But then, uh, you know, it, it, the Greek university is notoriously corrupt in the sense that uh, how do we build coalitions from those who are inside the university, who keep those who are outside the university. What do we do uh, while having this condition, a corrupt university of gatekeepers who don't want to let others in, uh, with a neoliberal government, essentially an alt-right neoliberal government, who are really aiming at putting an end uh, at public education? And I do think that this is going to be the case in the next five years. I think there's going to be systematic efforts to end uh, in some force public education. And you see the argument. Uh, it's already happening because it's so underfunded that you can't survive there. I mean, I had to teach in classes with no heating, uh, with um, the bathrooms have no light or water. Uh, the conditions are terrible. And, and it, is, um, it is devalued uh, uh, from all sides, from the teaching staff, from the academics who are here, from the students as well, because they don't get what they deserve. I mean, it's a public education, but it's very depressing to be part of that, to be part of that condition uh, with a government who are very aggressive and no essentially political voice in the sense of representation in the parliament or representation in the elections. No one is, a, is no one is arguing on a serious basis of what's going to happen to public education, how do we organize ourselves, how do we make this better. So I was, you know, on the one hand I felt, you know, thinking about it at a deadlock. On the one hand, you've got capitalism and venture capitalism and that condition you described to us and which is known across the world. And on the other hand, we've got a you know, kind of like feudal university here, whether you are associated with someone by family ties or by via clientelism, uh, by belonging to the main political parties. So, you know, my it's not so much it's not so much a question, it's a question. I thought, how do we how do we move forward knowing and my sense is that once the neoliberal policy is gonna come to Greece, it's gonna devastate everything because there's nothing holding all this thing together. So it's mostly, I um, don't know, a question, what, what is to be done? <laughs> what should we do? <laughs> so, I mean, my first response is um, it's that kind of diagnosis. So, it, I mean, this, um, you know, you're educated and it makes assumptions, doesn't it, about the kinds of institutions that people are educated in. Uh, that's 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 the problem with some of those first kind of iterations, and so you'll just have more of that. In what you've just described, having more of that is more of um, kind of patronage, um, clientelism, all of all of those kind of social relations. Um, you're on third one, and this is where I sit too. Is that we, and it's why I've done a specific case of of, of England, um, not Scotland, um, and not Wales. Uh, they have different fee structures. Okay. No one's basically saying that they're running out of money at all, you know, um, and, and they've managed to get enough, continue with enough pressure uh, in there. So what we need is uh, the kind of granular kind of analysis um, uh, around um, the institutions within uh, territories, I would probably say, in relation to particular forms of uh, political organisation uh, or forms of public power, um, their relationships to uh, different forms of uh, capital, venture capital isn't popping up everywhere, finance capital and so on. I mean, it's looking, and, it, and it's also looking for the bits of, of education. It's very acute at where it thinks it wants to invest. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't want um, to invest in um, you know, the mass. I mean, it's got no interest in that. It's interested in investing in those bits. And I've seen, actually, the analyses of where the investors, um, Hall and IQ is a good example at the moment of a company that provides information to investors as to where the uh, most profits are to be kind of extracted. So my, my, my view is that we need um, not the kind of analysis that is anodyne and... and, and, and um, and very anodyne, the first kind of accounts. Not the kind of analysis that Piketty is putting up, mm -hmm. either. What we need are, it, it is the kind of analysis that I'm trying to present 
um, and where uh, it's uh, it, sociologists, political economists, and 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 so on um, are also trying to uh, get a much more kind of complex understanding of the dynamics of capitalism um, and the way in which it's actually working. Mostly what we've got on the table if we're looking at privatising and education is those kind of first two in and of. Um, but in fact, actually, we've what we're calling the, um, following uh, a few other writers, um, the Wall Street consensus. Um, there's some very complex things actually going on, and we need them in the frame because essentially um, you can't do the kind of di you can't do the work of imagination and campaign development and things like that unless you've got a pretty good diagnosis of what is it that's going on and it's not it doesn't look all the same everywhere you know if you went down to brazil you'll find in the universities the elite institutions are publicly funded uh, and the private institutions um, are where um, the out group go, as it were. Lula did a little bit about trying to get scholarships for some of them, into, but they're into, nevertheless, the private institutions. They're not elite institutions. They do not take you in the direction of the well-paid jobs um, and so on. So the, the, the social formations and the institutions uh, will represent uh, class strategies. They absolutely do. And those class strategies from territory to territory to territory actually do differ. Um, we know in England it's the... Um, so-called public institution, public schools that are the big feeders. It's not new to anyone here, but nevertheless, um, in Australia, we don't have that kind of um, set of institutional arrangements. Um, and so, again, it's um, good diagnosis, informed diagnosis of the kind of diagnosis, I think, where we're also um, willing to... Um, build a language of description to theorise, to not just hark back to, well, Marx didn't say this or Marx said this. You know, the world has changed. Um, and our responsibility as intellectuals, doesn't matter where we are, um, as intellectuals caring, concerned to analyse what's actually going on, is to also do the job as Balabar is doing. And it's w well worth a good read, um, and I'm happy to send a reference list. Um, to, to actually try and develop a language for ourselves um, around the rise and the rise of finance capital. Um, you know, what are we looking at with these big uh, techno firms? Don't pay any tax, you know? And yet, if you have basically got um, of those five big companies um, there, um, the wealth of Germany, France, and the UK, that's serious wealth that's privately owned, that's not in public institutions because, in fact, they don't pay tax. Yeah. Even some tax would go a long way. But we get tax 6% of student if we get a student loan in the list, at least in the UK, yes? Something like that? How much is it? Oh, the, no, the interest rate would... Um, no, the government pocketed the interest rate. The government pocketed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and to be fair to Piketty and colleagues, they are pushing on the front of um, taxation. You know, and, and uh, Wolfgang Strake, who's a real, I love his work, um, buying time. So you can see he kind of thinks it's imploding. Um, but um, it argues um, very persuasively, in my view, that what we've seen is a shift from the, um, the tax state to the debt state. Um, and at the moment, I can see this in um, the Conservative. Um, they want to drop taxes um, for the wealthy. It's the one thing, I think, was it Stiglitz, who was the advisor to Clinton at the time, regrets significantly that he advised them to drop the corporate rate of tax. It's surprising, but it's 20 years down the line, so... Yeah. yeah, but that was the advice to the Clinton administration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and he regrets yeah, that. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, he says that that was actually a real mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's obvious why that would actually be um, the case. But at the moment, essentially, short of you know, you just go into a cheaper space. Ireland is a good example. Um, there's some moves to you know lift the if if you're not paying 20%, then um, because I think it's at 15% corporate tax in Ireland, um, then they've got to make up the difference of the 5%. But I don't know how they're all going to work out. But because education, um, our institutions of social reproduction, are uh, in that sense dependent on um, taxation systems, 
more or less, otherwise you've got private means, um, then essentially um, in order to have some degree of um, the social contract kind of honoured uh, there. Um, so anyway, I'd say um, good thorough diagnosis, a good, um, a good rereading of Luxembourg, um, to also be inspired by her as a campaigner, um, as, 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 as someone right back then also being incredibly aware of um, the exploitation of, of, of nature. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to work with with Luxembourg. But there's also a lot of work that we've got to do. Thank you very much, Susan. Are there any more questions? If there aren't, let me thank Susan Robertson. Thank you so much, Susan, for this fascinating talk. Thank you for joining us. Great pleasure. And um, personally, thank you for always supporting our new ventures <laughs> and our new plans and projects. Uh, thank you very much for attending today. Uh, let me remind you that you have another seminar coming up uh, in two weeks uh, from now. Yours is the 10th, is it? The 10th of February. And we'll have Kanishka. Gwena Verdana, who is going to talk to us about neoliberalism in Sri Lanka, crisis, protest, and left strategy. So we'll be waiting for you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.